There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take With a down, dairy, 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 down, down Hello and welcome to the first ever listener episode of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a storyteller, writer and English romanticism obsessive. And I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts, award-winning poet, playwright, Shakespeare scholar and witch, Eleanor Conlon. Hello. So first listener episode. Oh, yeah. So we're releasing this episode on Monday, the 3rd of July, a week before our second series starts. It's very exciting. Yes, it is. And it's lovely to be telling stories sent to us by listeners from across our Three Ravens community. Yes. So all of these stories were sent to us via Three Ravens podcast at gmail.com. If you have your own favourite folk tales that you would like us to tell on a future listener episode then please do send them through to that same address three ravens podcast at gmail.com also as ever if you'd like bonus content including exclusive episodes the monthly three ravens newsletter packed with magic spells tarot spreads folk traditions for the month and much more text versions of our stories and all of our episodes ad free Mm -hmm. do consider supporting us on patreon via patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast as for our stories today we have four to share and a poem to finish, each of which was sent between March and May of 2023. Our first story today is the Crowhurst U, which comes from Georgia, who sent her email on the 6th of March 2023. The Crowhurst U in Surrey is thought to be around 4,000 years old, which would make it one of the oldest of its species in the UK, earning its national heritage status. The Crowhurst U has seen many civilizations in her time. The Romans, Anglo-Saxons, Vikings and Normans all wandered under her weary branches, and she's believed to have had particular religious significance to pagans. In early times, Yews were probably the only evergreen tree in Britain. Both Druids, with their belief in reincarnation, and later Christians, with their teaching of the resurrection, regarded it as a natural emblem of everlasting life. This is because of the unique way in which yew trees grow. Their branches grow down into the ground to form new stems, which rise up around the old central growth as separate but linked trunks. After a time, the new growth cannot be distinguished from the original tree, so the yew has always been a symbol of death and rebirth, and the new that springs out of the old. The Crowhurst U witnessed and survived the English Civil War, where a cannonball became embedded in its trunk. The shot is thought to have been aimed at a local farm, which was a royalist settlement at the time. And that cannonball was discovered in 1820, when the tree was hollowed out by locals who added a doorway into its trunk. The tree was then used as a summer house, where groups of up to 15 people could come and socialise, all up until a storm caused the roof to collapse during the Victorian era. In the years since, the tree has grown around the door, meaning it cannot be moved or opened, though some say that the right combination of knocks and words on the right night of the year will open the door, revealing a hidden world inside. Wow, what a lovely story. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Now, Surrey is actually coming up in Series 2, isn't it? It is. So I'm hoping we might be able to head out and actually visit the Crowhurst U. Oh, I'd love to go. As part of that. That sounds great. Well, thank you very much, George. That's really interesting. And what about a cannonball trapped in it for hundreds of years? Brilliant. Yes, a Civil War era cannonball. I wonder where that cannonball ended up now. Yeah, I have no idea. (laughs) Perhaps it's in a local museum. 
Our second story today is the folklore of the Scarlet Pimpernel, which comes from Dawn, who sent her email on the 28th of April. There are a few pieces of folklore attached to Scarlet Pimpernel flowers, including that if you wear them, you'll have the ability to communicate with animals. Interestingly, the plant has alternative names like the poor man's weather glass and the shepherd's clock. And this is because the flowers are said to open at eight in the morning and close at about two in the afternoon, unless it's set to rain, in which case they won't open at all. These strange behaviours in part explain why scarlet pimpernels are thought to be magical plants, and there's nothing else quite like them in nature. In Germany, they're known as Gauchheil, which means full heel, and in folkloric medicine, the poisonous flowers were used to make treatments for people experiencing melancholy. The genus's name is Anagallus, which comes from the Greek to laugh. This is because when the shy flowers opened, it was said to indicate the mood of someone whose depression was lifted. Most people might be less familiar with the flowers themselves, but might know the name from the character of the Scarlet Pimpernel, who featured in the novels of Baroness Auxie. In her books, the Scarlet Pimpernel is a gallant gentleman who, with his band of loyal followers, worked to rescue French aristocrats sentenced to execution by guillotine. As a hero, the Scarlet Pimpernel left a flower at the scene of his rescues and used the symbol of the flower in his correspondence. He was famed for his surprising disappearances, which echo the behaviour of this magical flower, which in opening and closing as it does, is said in legend to link human life to other realms and the wild. Oh, that's so interesting. And I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, but until Dawn emailed us, I didn't even realise the Scarlet Pimpernel was a flower. Did you just think it was uh, the character? <laughs> yeah, I just thought it was this kind of, this hero, this gallant gentleman famed for saving French aristocrats, which I always thought was a weird feature of the books because a lot of the aristocrats aren't actually that sympathetic to start off with. <laughs> no, it's, it's, he's a good hero though. Yeah. And as memorably portrayed by Richard E. Grant in a BBC series. Definitely. And I also had a boss who used to disappear, like the Scarlet Pimpernel. Anytime anyone needed him, he'd just be gone and no one knew where he was. Was that his nickname? Yeah, we all knew him as the Scarlet Pimpernel. But did he make you laugh? <laughs> he did, actually, when he was around. Well, made, there you made are. The chocolate. Yeah, he was a nice guy. Um, but yeah, I think really interesting about this habit of opening up particular times of the day. Mm. I guess it makes sense to catch sunlight and so on and so forth. But it's also understandable why it might have been seen as a magical flower. Maybe I should adopt the Scarlet Pimpernel as my symbol because that's about my productive time, eight in the morning till two in the afternoon. <laughs> that's true. And post two o'clock, I'm not much use. <laughs> <laughs> it's all downhill from there. <laughs> Our third story today is the myth of the penned cuckoo, which comes from David, who sent his email on the 8th of May. Though this story comes from Oxfordshire, it's not specific to only that county. There are versions from Nottingham and Cornwall where, apparently, cuckoos are supposed not to migrate, but to hide in caves until spring. The myth is particularly prevalent in my local landscape, and there are 15 points labelled as cuckoo pen on the 1900 Oxfordshire Ordnance Survey map. One is in our local parish of Swincombe. There's another at Lugner and another at Sherburn. All of these places share similar positions. They are at high points on the north edge of the Chilton Scarp, tend to have the shadow of some sort of structure, and often there's been a historical find there. Ours, for example, was home to a hoard of Roman coins. The folklore of these places is linked to an old tale retold in the 1630 text The Merry Tales of the Wise Men of Gotham in a story called The Hedging of the Cuckoo. But there are lots of cuckoo legends. For example, there are aspects of fertility associated with cuckoos. And one legend has it that if a young girl, on hearing the first cuckoo's call in spring, counts the number of its notes, it will tell her the number of years to come before she'll be married. As for the myth of the cuckoo pen itself, so the story goes, the cuckoo was historically seen as the harbinger of spring, bringing with her a song of sunshine, cheer and fine weather. 
Liking her music and its many benefits, a group of local people therefore decided that by trapping the cuckoo, which appeared in their local hedgerow each year, she would sing her song all the year round, making spring last forever. So it went that the people of the village surrounded the cuckoo, singing in the hedge, and all linked hands, carrying with them the equipment needed to pen the cuckoo into the hedge. They began to creep nearer and nearer, and as they did, the cuckoo's song became sweeter and brighter. Just as they made their final approach, however, the bird flew away into the sky, much to the villagers' great frustration. The wise men of the town concluded that their mistake was having too small a hedge. They therefore determined to let the hedge grow taller and to try again next year. No one knows how many years the wise men tried this for, or how big the hedgerow grew, but the seasons pass just the same in Oxfordshire as they do everywhere else, so the cuckoo remains free, even if the cuckoo pens still litter our landscape. Well, thank you, David. That was a very interesting story. It was. And I, of course, remember the wise men of Gotham because they popped up in our Nottinghamshire episode. They did, didn't they? they? Yeah. Um, and I remember reading at the time that the hedging of the cuckoo was one of the silly things they tried to convince the king that they were all mad. Yes. So <laughs> I didn't realise this, but there are like 56 different ruses that the wise men of Gotham came up with. They were extremely thorough. <laughs> yeah. I, I think an inspiration to all who want to deter passing monarchs yeah well i don't know do we want to deter passing monarch i don't know i'd quite like to talk to the king if the king came through i'd like to invite him in for a cup of tea and a bun all right then well i will uh i'll put down my cuckoo penning equipment in that case and uh, save that for a different monarch's visit <laughs> now our final story today is called badbury clump which comes from sam who sent her email on the 23rd of may Badbury Clump is a large Iron Age hill fort near Highworth in Wiltshire that's rich with folklore and legends. Some say it was the site of King Arthur's final battle on Mount Baden, others that a golden coffin is buried at the top of the hill fort, and legend says the colony of ravens that live there are associated with the Celtic war god Bav Cartha, the Battle Crow, who is sister to Marsha and Anand, the Three Morrigan. More recently, in the 1950s, there was a famous lady living in London who made her living entertaining political and well-known male folk. This lady, whose name is lost to time, had a grand house in London and a lucrative business making sure she kept these men happy. Of course, the nature of her work meant she had to be very secretive, as many would have had their reputations shattered if word got out. As we all know, secrets have a way of getting loose. And so it was that this lady ended up at the courthouse charged with prostitution. Luckily for her, most of the lawyers, the police detectives involved, and most importantly, the judge himself, were all her customers. So it was that the lady in question ended up off the hook. After which, the men got together and bought her a house right in the middle of Badbury Clump. From this new home, the lady continued her business, though with just her few very special clients, going on to live a very long and happy life. She's now passed away, but it's said that when the wind blows in the right direction, you can still hear the cackles of her laughter and her voice with its London accent blowing through the trees. Ha <laughs> ha! That's great! I love it! I love it! <laughs> <laughs> now, Sam's daughter sent us a beautiful drawing of the three ravens she did. sitting on their tree, which was very beautiful. So we're very, very pleased to receive that. Yeah, it was super cute. And thank you, Sam, for that tale. She said in her email that she didn't think it was that folkloric, but I don't know. I like it when in your village there's a place where somebody can point to and go, you know that place over there? Well, here's a story about it. Yes, I mean, that is the essence of folklore, yeah. in my view. So thank you very much, Sam. To finish, we thought it would be nice to read a poem sent in by one of our listeners. The poem is called Losing Fairy, which was written and submitted by Tim Lamban. How very slow seems childhood, yet fairy dreams of dales beneath. Bright stars become too soon overwhelmed with daily thoughts, mundane and practical. When the secret and the special become other loves, so from us seeps the magic as starlight fades before the sun's harsh blaze of adult days. 
Some never see the door, the gate or stile from which beckons pixie, goblin or princess. And those that do must always fight to keep the sight and know the way. So soon lost amidst a world full made with cares and chaos, clamouring to fill the hours and the soul. Oh, how lovely is that? Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you also to Sam, David, Dawn and Georgia. As always, do check our website at threeravenspodcast.com for our archive of all our past episodes, to read our blog with expanded information and photos supporting each episode, and to visit our shop for Three Ravens merchandise. More merch coming soon, actually, uh, including the cards from the winners of the first Three Ravens card design contest. Yeah, we're going to be announcing those winners this very week. It's very exciting. Do also follow us on facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast, Instagram at Three Ravens podcast and Twitter at Three Ravens pod. And if you have five minutes, please hop on to iTunes or Apple podcasts and write us a review. Each one really does help. It really does. We will be back next week with episode zero, which will fill you in on our plans for the series, including a few new things we've been cooking up. And episode one will be out that same day, which will see us visiting the historic county of Cumberland. Oh, sausages. Yes, sausages, ghosts, witches, standing stones. It's going to be great. And if you can, do consider supporting us on patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast. Until next time then, while our stories have gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production produced by me. Martin Fox. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo was designed by Ollie James Dare. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean men, with a down, derry, derry, derry.